Okay. We're recording. All right. I was hoping to see a couple more friends in the audience, so uh, we might as well just get started and uh, they can catch up. So, hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, I want to thank Circle City Con for having me out and hosting me. Uh, I want to thank you guys for coming back after lunch and spending your post-lunch coma with me. Um, before we get started talking about how I learned to stop worrying and expect pen tester mistakes, let me ask a couple questions. Who in the audience is a blue team member? Who gets paid to defend networks? Okay, good, good. Uh, and who is, where are my red team members at? Where are the guys? Yeah, okay. So you guys might want to leave. You know, we're, uh, this is mostly for my blue team bros, but, uh, we're going to make fun of you red team guys a little bit, just a little bit. But last question. Who here has heard the adage that defenders have to be right 100% of the time and attackers have to be right only once? I think everybody's heard this, right? But today I'm going to give you guys the, the TTPs, the IOCs to help prove this myth false. So before we dig into that, who am I? I'm the ever-lovable Jeremy Nielsen. Most of you don't know me. For those of you who do, I'm sorry, Ryan. <laughs> the folks who know me. Uh, I'm a longtime MySec member out of Michigan. Uh, most of you may know me best for my trolling on Twitter. But I love security operations. I love digging into IDS alerts. I love dealing with my SIM alerts, trying to hunt for threats. Inevitably, when I'm looking at a TCP dump or a screen that looks like this, somebody's walking by and they make the, the comment that, uh, doesn't it look a lot like the Matrix, right? But I don't even see the code anymore. I just see blonde, brunette, redhead, APT1, China. And when I'm digging through my SIM alerts, I like to feel like this guy, right? I'm creating my rules, I'm threatening for hunts, writing new rules. I feel like Nazgul hunting for his prey. I feel like a real badass, right? My team will probably tell you I'm more like this guy, right? The Gordon Ramsay of security operations. You know, yelling at them for mishandling malware on, on some dude's laptop. I don't yell at my team, but I did make one of them cry once. But I think the, the vision of blue teams that I hate the most is when a red team guy is giving a presentation or running down a, a test that he did. It makes the, the blue team, you know, he walks in, spends five minutes on the network, gets domain admin access, and the blue team was just standing there like a Walmart greeter saying, hi, welcome to our network, please don't steal anything. Can I take a look inside your packets? So let me set the stage for, for what prompted this presentation. One morning, our service desk got a phone call from an executive's admin assistant. Her phone wasn't working. Would they mind coming up and taking a look. Now, anybody who spent any time in any size organization knows you do whatever you can for the executive admins. They're the ones with real power. They know what's going on, right? So the service desk guy goes running up there, and, you know, admins have these huge phone systems, the multi-line switchboards, lots of dial pads and stuff. So he's rooting around under the desk, and there's all sorts of cabling, and things are unplugged. Some stuff's plugged in. It looks weird. But cabling's all a network team job anyway, so he calls the network guy up. The network guy runs up there, and a couple minutes later, he calls the SOC. Security Operations Center answers, hey guys, on this phone issue, yeah, some stuff's unplugged and there's a, there's a, something plugged into the network and it's not one of ours. So our incident response plan looks something a little like this. <laughs> Somebody got lit up, they're running around. Is this an incident? Is it just a pen test? What's going on, right? Hair's on fire. So we send a SOC guy up there to, uh, to take a look. He goes up there, sees the device, unplugs it. It is what it is. And he brings it back down. So we're looking at this thing, trying to figure out what the heck is it? It definitely doesn't look like one of ours. We're not sure quite what it is. You know, we're, we're thinking it might be a Pony Express. We're looking for a logo like that. We're looking for some sort of asset tag, identifying mark. There's nothing, right? But after a little bit, we figure out it's an Intel Nook. It's this new unit of computing, right? A little micro form factor PC. You toss some laptop RAM in there, you toss a hard drive in there. It had a, a couple of dongles attached, you know, a couple of network adapters, a GSM modem, but and as we're looking at this, they were like, well, there's a hard drive, right? What's on the hard drive? So we have a service desk monkey that's got a couple of adapters, and one of those worked, and we managed to mount the drive and notice that it's unencrypted. It is what it is. So with this unencrypted drive, we were able to quickly find identifying information showing us this was a pen tester device with a company that we know we do business with. So that helped bring the uh, the scale down a little bit. 
but we had free access to the drive. Everything was unencrypted. We had access to all their tools. But not only do we have access to all their tools, we had access to bash history and their logs, right? So as we're digging through that, we quickly find that they were trying to troubleshoot their, their network connection. They were running NAC bypass scripts and trying to see what was going on. And so that told us that they never actually got onto our network. So again, lowered the severity rating of this incident quite a bit, reduced our level of fear. They gave up around 3 a.m. and hadn't been back on the box uh, until we had found it. But we saw a lot of connections going back to a mail server that they were using for command and control. And they left their credentials on there, unencrypted, not hidden, no passphrases, no nothing, right? So what happens next is a little controversial. We're not quite sure what happened, but apparently overnight, somebody allegedly logged into their mail server that was also their command and control server. And we're not quite sure what happened because nobody fessed up. There were no logs. There was no IP addresses. There was nothing, right? But apparently the server got bombed overnight and stopped working. Needless to say, the pen testers were pissed. <laughs> they rage quit the pen test. They gave up. They walked off the job. And I can't say I can't blame them, right? Because they were there to pwn us and ended up getting pwned in the process. I mean, they were there to assess our security, right? They're not there to be the model of security. I mean, they didn't encrypt their drive, their sensitive data. They didn't segment their trusted and untrusted network. Allegedly, they had their credentials stolen and used against them. And there were no logs, no IP addresses, no incident response, right? So they totally got pwned with all the techniques that they were supposed to be using against us. So no doubt that they were upset. But this taught me a valuable lesson, right? The lesson was, and I hope to impart this with you, that we don't have to be right 100% of the time, that the pen testers are going to make their own mistakes, and that you can expect them, you can detect them, and then you guys can win. So today I'm going to give you four use cases for detecting pen testers. We're going to start off by talking about the tools that they use. We're going to talk about detecting rogue machines on your network. We're going to talk about pass the hash. We're going to spend just a little bit of time talking about brute force attacks, and then we're going to follow up with incident response. How do you do, what do you do once you find these guys on your network? Now, Ren and Stimpy always said, uh, what rolls down hills, stairs alone and in pairs, rolls over your neighbor's dog. It's logs, 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 right? Every use case is going to have a dependency on certain types of logs. We'll tell you what kind of logs you need to gather in order to, to be effective here. And you guys should be feeding your logs into a sim of some sort. Now, I'm pretty partial to ArcSight. But you're going to want to have something where you can ingest these logs, you can correlate, you can write alerts, you can base, write simple rules off of what I'm presenting today, uh, and get alerted very early on when a pen tester has hopped on your network. The other thing that I want you to take away is everything here can be picked up in logs and packet captures on your network. It didn't take a lot to go through the tools that pen testers use to figure out how I could detect them on the network. So my advice to blue team folks is watch the red team presentations Watch for new tools being released. Play with them in your lab or on your network. Figure out how they work, how they're going to be used against you. See what logs get generated. So you can write your own rules, get ahead of those attacks, and be the heroes. Now, it's worth noting that I'm going to be presenting a lot of information to you today. The slides are not going to be available. And rather than scribbling down furiously, I have handouts available with each of the IOCs. So for the blue team folks, come see me afterwards. I'll have the handouts available. But we might as well jump right into it, right? Let's talk about detecting pen tester tools. Pen testers love their tools. Makes it really easy, right? Makes it repeatable. They can get the same results every time. They don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. It also makes it really easy because most companies don't have any type of reasonable security program that these guys can walk in and just script this thing out, right? They can hand a junior pen tester at one of the puppy mills uh, just a set of scripts to just run through and pwn the network and write a report and they're done, right? But that arrogance and that confidence, we can use to our advantage. We can flip that around, we can expect them, and we can detect them. So for this, you're going to need to use proxy logs and DNS logs. Now, I'd ask who has a proxy, but I don't want to call anybody out. Um, but if you don't have a proxy on your network, you really need to get one. If you don't have a proxy that's getting security-relevant categories for the different websites, 
Uh, you need to get one that does, blue code or one of those that, that's pretty effective. But you'll get a lot of value, a lot of mileage out of proxy logs. If you don't have those, you definitely need to get your DNS logs. Uh, Windows DNS servers, it's going to be incredibly resource intensive. Turn on that debug, debug log anyway. Send that stuff to your SIM. It is what it is, but you're going to want to have these logs. Now, the first tool that most pen testers, I'd say almost every pen tester is going to use on your network is going to be Kali Linux, right? I haven't ran across anybody who says, oh, no, I don't use Kali. Everybody uses Kali because it's really easy, right? The tools are already pre-installed. They work. You don't have to have any fuss, no muss. It's simple, right? But they've got this slogan that the quieter you become, the more you're able to hear. And I find this really kind of funny because Kali Linux by itself is really noisy. And you can detect that noise with just a few simple rules. Now, it's noisy when you're doing an install. It's got a call out, does a whole lot of apt-get. After the first boot, it's also making calls out. And anytime you do any type of updates or any type of installs, it's going to make calls out there, too. And let's not forget that Kali 2.0 implemented automatic updates. You can't turn that stuff off very easily. Now, it's worth noting for the blue team guys particularly that if they're doing a live CD, it's not nearly as noisy. But you could always find those and then use the tour password, right? Because nobody changes that password. But needless to say, if your pen testers are seeing this in their Kali instance and they're on my network, I've detected them through my proxy logs and my DNS logs. And the way that I'm detecting them is because I'm looking for these items. And again, these will be on the handout you guys can grab at the end. But look for http.cali.org, security.cali.org, and archive-some number cali.org. I'm usually archive-4, but your mileage may vary. Now, people may go out to www.cali.org, and that's fine. Uh, you may want to detect on that, but this is actionable. This is telling you somebody's doing something on your network. I had a friend that, when they saw this presentation, went back to their network and didn't find pen testers, but found people inside their network that were downloading Kali images and doing some questionable things. So they were finding insider threats right away. You'll also want to look for these. When you're installing Kali Linux, it asks you what time zone you're in. And then it starts making calls out to debian.pool.ntp.org. Now, if you run a lot of Debian on your network, that may be a false positive. Most of us are going to be running Windows on our network. Debian should be pretty rare, so you can look for that. But there's also a tool on Kali Linux that 30 minutes after the first boot starts calling out and downloading the Mac OUI database that has all the vendor associations for, for the first six digits of a Mac address, probably for Aircrack or something. And then it keeps downloading that fully every week after that. That's going to be a lot more rare on your network. People aren't downloading unless you're a network card manufacturer, the IEEE.org stuff. Another tool that you're likely to see on your network, none of us secure our networks. We've got MSO8067 out there. We've got all sorts of vulnerabilities. And the red team is just willing to, uh, they just know the right exploit to use that. So they're going to load up Metasploit and pop your, uh, pop your boxes and get those reverse shells, right? But every good guide, Offensive security, the hacker playbook, all the good guys end up saying, before you run MSF console, run MSF update. When MSF update runs, on Kali Linux, it makes a call out to http.kali.org. On other installations of Metasploit, it makes calls out to updates.metasploit.com. So just add that to your rule, right? Just look for calls out to these URIs, or these uh, domain names. One of my favorite tools is Burp Suite, right? I love doing application security assessments. I love getting in there, seeing how the application works, fiddling around with it, breaking stuff. When you run Burp Suite for the first time, it makes calls out to pro.portswigger.net and perfdata.portswigger.net. Even if you tell it to not send anonymous usage statistics, it's still making those calls out. Every time you open it up afterwards, it's making calls out to portswigger.net, and this IP address gets pinged before any DNS requests are made when you open up Burp Suite. Now that's in the Kali Rolling 2016.1. I think it's hard coded in there because it's coming before any DNS request. It may change in future releases since we're videotaping this. But the reason that these calls are going on is because it's checking for updates automatically to let you know, hey, there's a new version available. And people have asked Port Swigger to turn this off or at least have the ability to turn this off. And the developers tell them, we're not going to do that. 
So why not detect it? Now, NICTO is probably less likely to be seen on your network. It's a tool that I use in web application assessments, but again, like Metasploit, it's not going to automatically update, but you're going to update it before you run it anyway. So make a check to see if anything's calling out to www.cert.net. When I see this, it makes me think of some sort of computer incident response team or some CERT, US CERT, Carnegie Mellon CERT. It's not. It's somebody downloading or updating NICTO. And since you're writing that anyway, take a look at the user agent string and just detect on NICTO for somebody running that internally on your network because it shouldn't be there. The tool you're more likely to see on your network is Maltigo. This one I like. Maltigo makes a whole lot of calls out to www.perturva.com. And maybe you'd see this in part of your day job. I don't know. It's unlikely for me to see marketing folks, finance, using Maltigo. So take a look at these hits. But it's worth noting, when you open up Maltigo in Cali, by the time you get to this first screen, the startup screen, you've transmitted 1,500 packets to Paterva.com. By the time you get to the end of the startup wizard, you've transmitted 30,000 packets to Paterva.com. So you might as well detect it. There's a lot of cool URIs in there that'll set it apart from somebody just browsing the website. Now, I've not seen Core Impact used on my network, but somebody asked, and I did a little digging into this. Uh, it's common for, for uh, penetration testers to be using this to look for vulnerabilities. So might as well look for impact.coresecurity.com on your network. When it's checking for updates, it's calling out to there. Now, we talked about a lot of the tools that pen testers are using to attack you. But think about the other tools that pen testers need in order to do their day job, right? I mean, pen testers are just like the rest of us. They've got to put in their TPS reports. They've got to log into the VPN. They've got to log into webmail to keep up with rumors and things going on in the office. So why not look for those things? Do a little bit of OSINT. Find out who your company is using for penetration tests and start doing some, some reconnaissance on what they use for VPN, what they use for mail, what other tools they might be using. For example, Rapid7, they end up VPNing out to Mario and Luigi.rapid7.com, and they check their mail on OWA.rapid7.com because, hey, who's looking for that, right? Let's roll into talking about detecting rogue machines on the network. Now, in one of the pen tests that we were doing, we let them sit on the network a while. We detected them early. We saw Cali popping up all over the place. and It was really kind of funny, but we knew they were pen testers. We were expecting it. It wasn't a big deal, so we just let them alone. And after, At the end of the week, I was bored on a weekend doing some hunting in my ArcSight active channel. Um, I knew the IP addresses that it triggered, but I wanted to know what they were doing. And it was very easy for them. We knew that they were changing their IP addresses, but I couldn't figure out what they were changing their IP addresses to. So it occurred to me, it was likely they were changing their IP addresses, but unlikely they were changing their MAC address. It's easy to change IP addresses. DH client, bam, it's done. MAC addresses are easy too, but not as likely. So when we talk about looking at detecting rogue machines on your network, you've got an easy way to do this. You've got your DHCP logs. It's something that plugs into the network, it's going to make that broadcast. It's going to end up in the logs. Also check your DNS logs. So what I found is our pen testers were using uh, virtualization hosts, VMware, VirtualBox. So I went online, I grabbed a list of the, uh, the different Mac OUIs, and sure enough, they're out there. But it's also worth noting at this point that while pen testers are using this, we all have policies against somebody bringing in their personal machine and putting it on the network, right? We all have BYOD policies. We don't allow somebody to take their phone and just put it on the network. So you got to ask yourself, why would you allow somebody to have a virtual machine that's unmanaged, untrusted on your network. So why not use this to also look for policy violations? And then also look for the joker. So as I was looking through my DHCP logs and trying to identify where these guys were hopping to and build out a, a larger picture of what they were doing, we noticed one guy was using VM Workstation and one guy was using VirtualBox. And I think it was the older guy that was using VirtualBox. But it made it really easy for me to now give a little bit of attribution. Thing one was doing these things and popping shells and things like that. Thing two was over here enumerating LDAP accounts. But since you're already looking at this stuff, why not take it one step further? Don't just look at VMs 
What happens if they install it on their laptop? What happens if they pop a box on the network, plug it in and you don't know about it? So take a look at all DHCP addresses. You might think, hey, I've got 1,500, I've got 5,000 boxes on my network. How am I going to stop and find these things? But it's really easy, right? Just make it really simple for yourself. Look for things today that fits your standard naming convention. Every company has some sort of naming convention to help the service desk or help the Windows admins identify cool machines on their network, where things are at, where they're located. So look for things that fit that and just create a whitelist, right? Have a list of, of endpoints that you trust. Look for things that don't meet that standard, right? If you start seeing iPhone, if you start seeing Android, if you start seeing vendors on your network like KPMG or Rapid7, that might be a might be a hint, right? Get those guys on a, on a guest network. Windows, by default, when you don't join it to a domain, randomly gives win dash and something that's probably a, a tie back to the MAC address. And hey, pen testers aren't going to give some random host name to their machine. They're just going to leave the default Kali. So why don't you look for Kali out there as well? Now, you're going to end up with a bunch of machines that you're kind of on the border, right? It looks like it meets my standard naming convention, but maybe not, right? So just use Sys Internals tool PS logged in. You could, of course, always use and check uh, Active Directory losers and computers to see if it's in there, but that's a that's hard work. Just use PS logged in on a normal Active Directory domain. A standard user can run PS logged in against the machine and see their own username reflected back to them. If you get a response that says unable to query resource logins, that's going to tell you that it's probably not joined to your domain, and you should probably take a look at that. If you're using NTLM, probably. I mean, it's a Samba connection, so yeah. Um, so let's talk about detecting past the hash. Now, there are a lot of different Active Directory type attacks that you're likely to see your pen testers use, right? I mean, there's pass the hash, pass the ticket, golden ticket attacks, silver ticket attacks, MS14068, since we don't patch our networks, right? But I think the one that we're all going to see, because we don't ever turn off NTLM, is pass the hash. Once they get on the network, they're going to look for that foothold. They're going to look to escalate their privileges. For this, you're going to want to get Windows security logs from as many machines as you want, right? As many as you're comfortable with. I don't advocate logging all the things. You don't have to get every Windows security log and every endpoint log on the network. But get at least a representative sample so you can get those logins, those failed logins, the successful logins. Now, it's kind of funny because our Windows admins don't quite understand how this works. They think, oh, the passwords are hashed on the machine. Nobody can use that. So if they dump it, what are they going to get, right? They don't realize that, you know, there's PS exec versions out there that allow you to do that. Uh, Metasploit allows you to use the hashes of a variety of tools to make it very easy to dump this. And then they'll start pivoting through the network looking to escalate their, uh, their privileges. For folks that don't understand what pass the hash is really doing or how that works, Microsoft has a pretty good guide on mitigating past the hash attacks, and eh, it's okay, it's pretty good. NSA has their Information Assurance Directorate. They put out a guide on reducing the effectiveness of past the hash. It's some 40-page document that basically tells you to turn off NTLM, and nobody turns off NTLM. We're all afraid of it breaking. Uh, management won't do that because something's going to break, and it never does, but we never turn it off anyway. But I, the guide that I think the security operations folks should be familiar with is spotting the adversary with Windows event log monitoring. You should print this out, have multiple copies around your SOC. People should be familiar with this, write rules around the items that are in there. But they talk about detecting past the hash as follows. I realize this is an eye chart, so we'll walk through this. You're going to look for event ID 4624 for successful logins, 4625 for failed logon attempts. It's going to be logon type 3. SMB is all remote login, network login, right? It's not interactive. Your account name is going to be not null. Now, if you haven't turned off NTLM, maybe you're still allowing null sessions on your network. So you might get a flood of null sessions with this. So ignore them. You'll also see anonymous login. Uh, ignore that as well, right? When this is being done against you, you may see some weird-looking usernames. Uh, so that should definitely be something that stands out. 
And then, of course, the authentication package should be NTLM. In ArcSight, the rule looks just like this. And so when you got a uh, pen tester on your network, and he starts hopping around and hits a machine that you get a Windows security event log, this thing's going to light up, right? And so you're going to want to track that back to the original source, see where it's coming from, and you've detected them. Let's spend a little time talking about detecting brute force attacks. For this, you're going to want a whole bunch of logs, right? Firewall logs. You're going to want your Windows security logs, just like in the last one. You're going to want to get your Linux syslog uh, logs so you can see those login attempts into your, into your Linux boxes. You're going to want to get as many logs as you possibly can. And you can filter that stuff down. You're looking for, for logins. You're looking for port access. But I believe that there's really four fundamental types of brute force attacks. Now, there's different variations on these. You could probably write a dozen different rules with variations on these. The first one that's important for us is username guessing. That's when you've got somebody coming from the same source, going through a whole bunch of different usernames. Now, chances are they're doing this to look for a, a foothold on the network. You want to pay attention to whether the credentials are guessed. Is it L Smith, M Smith, N Smith, O Smith? Or are these actual accounts that you're using? Are these legitimate accounts? Do you see service accounts in there? And you need to ask yourself, how did they get those usernames? Have they already dumped Active Directory? Do they already have an account that they have and they were able to dump Active Directory? Do you have null sessions enabled and they were just able to get that freely? So some of this is prep information that you're going to want to know ahead of time before the incident happens. But they've got a list of accounts and they're looking for the easy wins, right? You're going to be trying something like pizza123 or, you know, password1, right? It meets your complexity guidelines. They're looking for somebody who's either got weak credentials, hasn't reset their password, somebody who's a new account that's waiting to be used. They might be rolling through compromised credentials. But you'll want to create rules that just look for username guessing. This is going to be pretty popular for you. One that's going to be a little bit harder is brute forcing a single account. The reason this is going to be harder is because it's going to be prone to false positives. We all have networks where users forget their password, they lock themselves out, they've got to be reset, right? And that's going to trigger this thing enormously. But you're going to have pen testers who are going to do this low and slow type attack, right? Windows administrators think if they set up a password policy to block, uh, to lock out an account after three failed attempts in 30 minutes, that bam, Within this 30 minute time period, it's a static time period, it's locked out. It's actually a rolling time period. And so if they do a low and slow attack, most rules won't find them and it won't lock out the account and then they can keep guessing. It's going to be slow, it's going to take them a while. Why not detect on that? Now a lot of folks will argue with me and quibble over whether port scans are brute force attacks. We can have that argument later, but it made it simple to, to add in the same section with all of these. I mean, really, when it comes down to it, somebody is going through every possible IP address and every port on every IP address to see if there's something there, right? So, I mean, they're brute forcing it. Everybody turns off this rule in their SIB because they figure, oh, I'm going to get hit up on my external scans. I can't do anything about somebody scanning me externally, so I'm just going to turn that rule off. But rather than turning that rule off, look internally. Because inside your network, people shouldn't be port scanning. That stuff's not going to happen every day, and if it is, it's your network team or it's SolarWinds or it's something like that, right? So detect the port scans internally. Also look for address scans. This isn't going to get picked up by your normal port scan, but a pen tester is going to be on your network, and they're going to have an exploit that they want to burn. And so they're going to be looking for a particular port, port 1900, or they're going to be looking for something that's available on your network, and they're going to be scanning every IP address, looking for that open port to see if it's going to be vulnerable to it. Like I said, it won't be picked up by your port scan rules, so create a separate rule for this. We brute force our way through the brute force section. So now we get to the good stuff. What do you do once you found the pen testers on your network? How do you do your incident response? Now, the, the standard disclaimer, right? I'm not your lawyer, I'm not your mother. I'm not your manager. Some of the suggestions in here might be illegal. Some of them might put your job in jeopardy. But I'll start with a story. 
We were on a pen test. And it was about 9 o'clock in the morning. Our first Cali hit popped up. And the SOC admin looks at it and closes it. And there's another Cali hit a couple minutes later. The SOC admin says, uh, goes out to our red team expert guy, the guy who putzes around inside the network and schedules uh, pen test. Hey, Ron, is this you? Ron's like, yeah, yeah, that's me. Don't worry about it. So the SOC analyst closes it out. Fifteen minutes later, there's another Cali hit, closes it out. An hour later, there's another Cali hit. Ron, Ron, is, is this you? Are you sure you're, this is you? Oh, yeah, it's me. Don't worry about it. Close it out. An hour and a half after that, there's a printer making a call out to Cali.org. He calls me over and says, hey, this, this printer is a little bit weird. We should take a look at this. I'm like, okay. He says, well, there was a couple other hits this morning as well, but Ron said it was him, but I, I don't think this is him. I'm like, well, <laughs> why didn't you tell me that we had these hits earlier? What, did you dig into it? Did you look into it? No, no, it was him, so we closed it out. I'm like, well, he's a red team guy. Even if it is him, we should know what's going on on the network, right? You should dig into it, find out what he's doing, track it. So we end up calling a network team guy over. We've got an IP address. Map it back to a MAC address. We map it back to the port. And our guy says, no, that's not a, that's not a printer. And we're like, well, it's just Ron anyway, right? The port down. Five minutes later, I get called into a, a conference room. And it's Ron, a director, saying, hey, we've got to turn that port back out. We've got pen testers on the network. So we turned the, the, uh, the port back on. They also wanted me to, to kind of keep it on the down low, right? Don't tell them if there's pen testers on the network. Five minutes later, there's another Cali hit going out. It becomes really hard to give this, this um, to, to have a, a straight face and say, oh, yeah, it's not pen testers. So the gig was up. Let's talk about the good, bad, and ugly ways of responding to incidents. And there's a tie-in back to this in a minute. The good way of responding to incidents is to first just start running your incident response plan, right? Notify the people who need to be notified. Get an incident manager, an incident reporter. Start tracking that stuff down. Notify the people who need to be notified. Start doing your identification and, and segmenting things off. Understand what the attacks are. Before you do any type of remediation, go through your plan. The other thing to do is stop the clock, right? If you didn't know about pen testers being on your network, they're probably there to test you and your response process, right? So tell your manager, tell the people who set up the pen tests, hey, we detected these guys, and stop that clock early. And now that spins that conversation around from, uh, here's all the things that you missed, into, hey, great, you guys detected us early, and it changes the tone of that pen test. As part of your incident response, track those, machine, track those machines down. Where are they at on the network? Collect all the logs being generated. So on all the devices that they touch, get all the logs so you can see what they're doing. And logs are great, but they don't give you the entire picture. So if you have the opportunity, put some sort of port, uh, port span in there, any type of tap, port mirroring, whatever you can get to get full packet capture. Logs are great, but if you can see everywhere they're going from a full packet capture and you can see exactly what they're doing, that's going to be even better. The bad things to do? Shutting down that port early. In my story, we shut down that port without actually inv in, uh, investigating it, right? And we tipped our hand. As soon as we shut down that port, the pen testers could get up and walk out of the building before we even get up there to see where they're at or what they're doing. And they can come back some other time, plug into the network somewhere else, and we've lost that visibility. Since we know where they're at, let's leave them there for a little while. Don't unplug devices without knowing what you're doing first. 10, 15 years ago, the mantra was, stop the bleeding, right? Incident response was, isolate this as much as possible, keep it from spreading. Hi folks, Iron Geek here. Unfortunately, we had a technical problem, so audio should resume at about the uh, 37 minute, 20 second mark. Sorry for the problems.
I got this right. So the first one is, did I work with the? Well, the first part was that apparently from 1990, you learned how to filter the question that was actually text people, explaining the things that they're seeing and trying to do. So it's doing the job, not using the other. Okay. So yeah, the question is, is we learned about it. Can we work with them better to, to, to learn more about detecting what they're doing and, and better defending our network instead of being a dick? I mean, ultimately, that's what the two come down to. Um, so we had the Cali rule out there originally, and it was a very basic rule. We refined it, but it allowed us, I mean, pretty much universally to detect these guys early on. So there hasn't been a single pen test that, um, that we didn't catch the pen testers, right? But since they're on our network, we don't really fear the pen testers doing anything. We don't know what's going on. We've got logs. We use threat hunting techniques to see what they're doing and, and write new rules on top of that. Now, all the pen tests that I participated in, we pen tested regularly. We would pen test on a, a quarterly or at least semi-annual basis. Um, the reports weren't all that well. They, 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 they weren't written well. They didn't include a lot of information. Um, here's your high vulnerabilities. Here's the things to worry about, you know. After the one where the guy walked off the pen test, his report was, oh, you allow people physically into the building. Well, yes, duh, of course we know that, right? So what do we learn from that? Nothing, right? So I think there's some good stuff to learn from red team members. I think if you have a good pen tester and you find a good company out there, and they're out there, I think you might have to go with a boutique firm, maybe skip the, the junior pen testers. If you've got good security on your network, build up that relationship with the folks, uh, go back and forth. Now, in my case, we had a guy who set up our pen test and set those scopes, and so we weren't ever really directly dealing with those. We got the mood lighting. Yes? We did. Your mileage will vary on that. Um, our last pen test that I participated in with that organization uh, was a lot like that. Uh, so after the second week uh, with the with the team, we sat down with some incident response folks who were familiar with what was going on. Uh, walked us through some of the additional tools. So, I mean, we had some EDR tools, right? Endpoint detection response tools. They were picking up a lot of the, uh, the lateral movement on the network. Uh, and so helping our junior members, uh, it was more of a training session for them than anything. Here's what you're likely to see. Here's what you missed. Here are the things that are worth, worth going on. But we were, we were alerting on all that stuff anyway. So, um, you know, it sounds almost bragging that, oh yeah, we've got this great logging infrastructure, so we were picking these guys up right away, but I think the bigger takeaway is, is having an effective incident response, because you can do great detection with just the stuff that's presented here. If you've got other tools like a Carbon Black, a Bit9, uh, uh, Falcon Host, or whatever it is that's out there, you're going to get additional logs that you can detect on. It's all how you respond. If you've got a good incident response, um, that's going to be the part that matters. Can you track down everywhere they went? Can you get that remediated in a timely manner? Looks like that's it. Oh. Sure. That's a great question. I've seen this come up on IRC a couple of times. Uh, somebody had said that, uh, so the question was, should my time be better spent actually letting them assess the network and help us improve our security posture than wasting their time by QoSing them down? And the way that I, I look at this, somebody on, on IRC had talked about um, some, you know, happy-go-lucky blue team member shut down their port and, you know, that just, that, that ate up a day of their time. Uh, you know, they, we should just leave them alone. But the way that I look at this is there's different types of penetration tests, right? I mean, there's the ones where you're looking for all the vulnerabilities on the network and you're looking for the ways that, that 
all the different attack paths to get in. And perhaps those should be above board, right? But at the moment where you're uh, prancing around the network, nobody's told the blue team, hey, yeah, we've got the penetration coming in. They're going to be coming from this network, and here's what they're going to be doing. They're going to be on the network for two weeks. At the moment that this becomes a, a black box engagement, that's no longer testing my network to improve security posture. That's testing incident response. That's testing how we find folks and what we do with it once we find them. So I, I think it depends on the engagement. And the situations I've always found myself in is how good is the blue team and, and testing the blue team and trying to make us look bad. Both sides actually play with footing, and not necessarily equal footing, but footing uh, allows it to actually tie in a deep learning access. Possibly. So the, the question is letting them play around on the network. And during one of our pen tests, we did, right? We detected them. We're like, well, we don't, we're not too worried about the pen testers. Let's let them go, right? Just let's see what happens. Collect the logs later. Um, you can do that. I mean, it's perfectly valid response is to do nothing. But uh, no, I mean, actually, like, like actually have the blue team actually go after the red team and actually hack back. So you have both sides actually doing what they actually need to um, and actually have it so it's, it's, you know, you're playing chess against the opponent versus the person. Sure. No, I would just say that you go back to your incident response plan. So, um, I guess I would call that a third type of pen testing engagement where you're, you're playing against other folks and it becomes more of a CCDC type challenge rather than an actual pen test to improve your security posture. It just becomes an attack, defend, capture the flag type event. I think that'll be, oh, do we have time for one more? Yeah, we'll do one more. Okay. So we work with the company to say, here are the scenarios that we can hire to help you do that. And then we have the purple team uh, actually do that, but then it triggers the other one, the actual hire on this one. Okay. That'd be great too. I'd love to participate in something like that. So, very cool. Well, thank you very much, guys.